Hello, hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, it's so good to be back. Hi, Alicia. I have Hi. a guest here today. <laughs> um, so just to kind of give you guys backstory. So it's been, I've taken a couple weeks off because I needed some much, much needed holiday breaking. And, um, and then we were back to school on Tuesday and then it was a blizzard and school was out. So it was, it's been all very exciting. And today's topic has been super top of mind, obviously, because we are um, following up on the holidays. We are recovering, hopefully. Um, I'm just checking that this is all working on my other laptop. And um, I feel like now that the kids are back in school and you know, I can finally sort of get back to a normal routine. So I'm very excited about that. So I'm super excited to welcome Alicia Romano. She's from Tufts Medical Center. You are a registered dietitian and nutritionist. So yep. can you just tell me a little bit about what, what's your daily, what's your everyday life like? Like, are you seeing people who are looking for solutions or just any kind of sort of food, nutritional consult? What, what does your day look like? Yeah, so my day varies. Um, my I work um, most of my time in the nutrition clinic, whereas I see people who are looking for just general healthy eating, weight management, or I'll see patients who have more um, medical um, related nutritional concerns. So whether they have diabetes or heart disease, kidney disease, uh, chronic gastrointestinal issue. Um, so my day is essentially spent mostly with patients, interacting with them and helping them to create um, changes in their lifestyle, um, no matter what that means for their um, particular health concerns. Yes. And do you see an uptick at this time of year of people coming in and kind of looking for guidance? <laughs> Yes and no. I think we see an uptick in people who um, make the appointments, but it's the follow through isn't always there, which I think is kind of the one of the underlying problems is actually committing to it and being um, honest enough with yourself to, to, to go through with um, seeing someone like me. So um, I think it varies. Right. Well, so, you know, I think in, in my experience, just to kind of start big picture, you know, one of the biggest um, pitfalls in trying to set and achieve nutritional goals is just sort of making um, making things too big or too difficult, you know, mm -hmm. for yourself at the outset. Um, and, you know, I, I would just, I'd be curious, um, you know, I think, I feel like there are people who have told me I need to go cold turkey on X, Y, or Z in order to like really commit to it. Whereas I definitely feel like I just need, you know, I need things to be doable. But in your experience, you know, what have been the best ways to get nutritional habits to stick? Or do you feel like it's all over the map for what people can do? You know, it does vary. Um, I think one one really important thing to remember is to be honest with the type of person that you are. So you know for yourself that making kind of small achievable goals is works for you, whereas the cold turkey method works okay for some people, but it's never something that I really advise. Um, from the standpoint of positive nutritional changes, it really slow and steady does win the race. So achieving, um, setting goals that are very short term, very real. Those are the things that really lead to the most long-term changes. Um, so typically when I sit with a patient, I'll, you know, go over their overarching goal, whether it's weight loss, whether it's just kind of getting a better grasp on healthy eating, and then every appointment will tack away at only one or two really small lifestyle changes. And it seems, um, it doesn't seem monumental when they're there, and, and that's hard because we're in this culture where we need fast results and everything needs to sound so robust. Um, but then you'll see it over time, how successful that patient feels or that that client feels because they were able to achieve that simple goal and that keeps the motivation going. So I think, you know, being really realistic with yourself with those kind of small achievable goals at the outskirts doesn't seem um, like you're really doing much, but in the long term is what really um, makes it all stick, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment that I'm start seeing people start to join the broadcast. So if you have questions, please um, drop them in the comments. We have like, this is live happening. And even actually, if you come to this broadcast later, which I know a lot of people do, um, you know, feel free to drop your comments, anything you have for Alicia regarding um, nutrition, and we will get those answered for you. Um, well, that, that is good to hear. I, I definitely feel like, yeah, I feel like I'm always, I'm like the turtle in all, <laughs> whether I'm training for something or with food. So, um, you know, we talked about cold turkey. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of, I think I joked in the status update for this broadcast that like tis the season for Whole30 and yep. and keto and all sorts of things I don't really know about. But, um, you know, I found that 
personally, I'm a disciplined, you know, human being, but I still like, I like to have my sugar in my coffee and I like baking. And <laughs> that is something that um, brings me joy. So I, you know, a while back, actually, I worked with Tess on an article on um, like healthy, healthy cleansing and detoxing. And I would love for you to share kind of like, what are the best natural ways, you know, without going too crazy that you can add sort of detoxing foods or whatever into your diet, just kind of on an everyday scale? Yeah. So, you know, really any type of detoxing diet detox is such a like glamorized word now. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah essentially to, to bring it down back to home, the home base of the body, our body's an amazing thing and, it, and naturally detoxifies us. So that's why we have a liver and that's why we have kidneys. And I think in the article that the dietitian said the same thing. Um, the number one thing I can tell my patients is, and I think we'll probably talk about this later too, is water. You need water to do everything. You need water to run all the different cycles in your body for your metabolism. You need water to digest your food. You need water to um, let your kidneys work to their optimal function. Um, so getting that water in, it doesn't have to be any kind of crazy water. Just plain old tap water is perfectly fine. And hydrating yourself enough, um, being mindful of um, how much you are drinking throughout the day. That's one really easy tip that's not always easy to intervene with, but um, it's going to be better than any cleanse or, you know, Whole30. Um, and then if you look at the principle um, behind healthy eating, getting foods in our diet that promote digestion, um, like cruciferous vegetables um, that are high in water content, high in fiber content, fruits, vegetables, kind of that plant-based origin. Fiber, again, naturally kind of pulls waste from our bodies, um, which is really what the principle of detoxification is. So water and fiber combination, whether it be through more whole food products, like, like whole pieces of fruit, whole vegetables, whole grains, things along those lines is a really good place to start without having to be gimmicky or really restrictive. Yeah. And it, I mean, obviously like, um, you know, smoothies or something you make at mm -hmm. home. Like we just, we just, I, I find it's hard, especially in the winter to just, I don't know, pick up an apple or pick up mm -hmm. just a regular fruit. So I just like to toss spinach and then a bunch of fruit and water into, into the Nutribullet and just go. And that that's seems great. To, like that's valid. Yeah. Cause it's just all whole materials, right? <laughs> yeah. And so basically you're just, you're blending it together. So your mouth doesn't have to do the chewing, did it for yes. you, but all yeah. that fiber, the integrity is still there, which is really, really great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, but you know, another important thing too, if you look at really the reason that people feel great when they do these detoxes and these whole thirties, it's really not because they're detoxing. They, they likely are because they're being so restrictive. They're likely pulling away um, for a lack of a better term, a lot of the crap in their diet, a lot of the things that's like really highly processed, really refined in sugars, really high in salt, um, which tends to be more of the foods that we just kind of grab and munch on throughout the day. So we become more mindful of those choices as well, which is really what the basis of kind of establishing healthy eating plans and patterns is, is being mindful and aware. Um, and the, the, you know, these kind of glamorized detoxes creates a framework for that. Whereas, a lot of the things they're preaching, especially something like a Whole30, it is a bit restrictive, but the, the bare bones of it is fruits, vegetables, whole foods, and taking away those processed things. So I'd say that's really a, an easy step, you know, being um, insightful to how often kind of those sneaky, like added sugars, added salts, processed foods stick in the diet and be keeping an inventory on that and prioritizing, um, like, you know, you like your sugar in your coffee, maybe you keep that, but you take away something else that really doesn't have value to you. Right, right. Like the holiday cookies. Those are yeah. And just kind of linger. And you're still sitting there. Like, well, I shouldn't waste them, but they could go somewhere else, you know. Right. right. Okay. So you just you just talked. To, I love that you started with water, but then also acknowledge that why is water so hard? Um, you know, I think it's it's just seems so simple, um, but it's it's difficult for a lot of people mm -hmm. to implement. So, do you what kind of advice do you give to your patients about that? So water, yeah, it's funny. I, almost every patient I see, that's one of our number one goals is just getting them into the habit of that. And the easiest tip I can say, and this this sounds very obvious, is just having a vessel to drink from, having something accessible and big. Yeah. So have your like, exactly. <laughs> and especially if you're a desk job person, this sounds silly, but people are like, I don't want to have to get up and fill it up 15 times. So get something that big, 32 ounces, a big liter bottle or something. And let that be kind of your gauge for the day. 
if you don't have the vessel with you, you're much less likely to drink. And we're much more likely to go for the coffee or the, you know, the sugar sweetened beverages or something. Um, so that's really number one. And, you know, even keeping a tiny little bottle in your purse or in your jacket pocket or something like that, when you're on the go to keep you sipping throughout the day. Um, so that's kind of the obvious choice. But a lot of um, people that I work with tell me that water's boring. They get sick of drinking water. <laughs> um, so finding a way that, you know, you can hydrate yourself that appeals to you, whether it's like bubbly water, like the, the sparkling waters that are um, free of any sugar or um, artificial sweeteners, um, the, the seltzers, um, whether it's just a, the infused water. So you can get the little bottles that have an infused room and you can put cucumbers and lemons and strawberries and you can really kind of go to town. That's it's like spa water. So you feel a little bit more luxurious. Um, you can put lemon slices, whatever there is, it can be really nice. And then also looking at beverages that might be um, hydrating that aren't just water. So like decaffeinated um, teas, for example, do have some hydrating properties. So maybe throwing a tea bag in or doing hot water with lemon and some spices or something just to make it some more interesting. So I think finding something that works well for you that you find you can drink a lot of um, will also play a good um, play a good role in um, helping you drink a little bit more. Right. OK, those are great ideas. All right, so I want to talk to you about, so I'm a former, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a former neuroscientist and so mm -hmm. I used to be into data and all that stuff. And, and so I still love data tracking at, at some at some level, but I would be curious about your thoughts about um, caloric and activity type trackers. Like I, I found, I used to use my fitness pal every now and then and parts of me loved it because I, I loved how quantitative it was. And then parts of me just like, I found I was getting a little too obsessed with it and I didn't mm -hmm. like that. So, hi, yeah, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on stuff like that? I mean, I guess at one level, it's kind of like whatever works for a person, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you have recommendations when you're working with people? Yeah, so, you know, I have mixed feelings on some of like the trackers that actually give you data on like your calorie expenditure and things along those lines, because we don't really know that that data is correct. I mean, unless you're using a, a monitor, like some of the, the, the Fitbits and things like that, that can actually measure your energy expenditure. And in some regards too, they'll tell you, oh, you're eating too much sugar today because you had three pieces of fruit. So it can be a little bit misleading as far as, you know, what healthy eating is. Um, if I have a patient who likes to use um, a tracker like that, I always advise them to use it basically for the accountability standpoint of it and try to not really pay attention to all that data. When it starts to become consuming or it starts to become obsessive or anything along those lines um, is when I typically have um, people um, steer away from them. To be really honest with you, I'm a huge fan of just a handwritten journal or like mm -hmm. get, downloading like um, like a Google or some kind of spreadsheet for the phone where you can just write everything in and then use that to talk together. Because at the end of the day, calories tell us something, um, but you can eat the same amount of calories in bad food versus good food, not necessarily bad food, but you know, in junk food versus healthy food. Um, so you're better off kind of understanding, you know, what you're eating during the day the value of the balance of those foods and having something written that doesn't give you an opinion on it um, is sometimes a little bit more um, a little bit more um, friendly as far as, you know, um, getting the feeding back that's approachable, I guess you could say. I'm lacking the word that I'm looking for. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. It's, yeah. it's, it is better to have a big picture and, and yeah. those numbers are not necessarily going to capture sort of complexity. Yeah. Of things. I like to, I tell some of my patients, because I'll have a lot that come in, they're like, well, my fitness pal told me, I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's just data. It doesn't have, it's not a personal, you know, one-on-one -on -one that someone is advising you in this way, shape or form everyone's different. And so you can't use it as kind of like your, your bread and butter. It can be useful. Um, and if you find that you're the type of person that likes that accountability, then I say go for it. But as soon as you start feeling like it's becoming obsessive or consuming is when it's time to veer off because you shouldn't have to be on that forever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I love that you mentioned journaling because, um, you know, uh, earlier last year, and I think actually I might do another broadcast on this, but I was having all sorts of like just Age, what I called hashtag aging lady problems, like everything. Yeah, I'm sure it was perimenopause or whatever. Um, but I decided to just, I needed to start just writing all the things down in a, in a journal, like what I was eating, what I did for movement, what kind of supplements, you know, I was taking um, just because it felt so complex and multidimensional that I just, it just was simple. And I love being able to look back on it. So I'm really, really glad you mentioned that. 
I think that's great um, too. I don't mean to interrupt you, but another thing that I would say as far as the accountability and, and keeping yourself on track is in those journals, you know, we're so weight driven when it comes to sometimes making healthy changes, but tracking other things too, like your sleep, your sleep um, hygiene and kind of the, your energy levels, your digestive health can be really great in those types of hand journals because they give you other um, markers of success that aren't just a number on a scale. So yeah. that's another thing I like to add. Yeah, we don't even own a scale. So I, <laughs> no, my, yeah. my, my metric is like, do my pants fit? And yeah. I will admit I'm wearing yoga pants, right? <laughs> but maybe next month, maybe next month. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to remind people, if you've got questions for Alicia, please pop them in the comments and I'll, I'll address them um, live. Otherwise, we have several other things I want to talk about. But um, so I want to talk about snacking. Um, mm -hmm because now we're kind of getting past the season of snacking on Yule logs and things like that. Um, so I just would love if you've got some fresh ideas about snacks that actually like, I don't know, at this time of year feel really satisfying. Cause I, as I said earlier, when it's cold and raw out, like I'm just not as, you know, usually during the summer I can consume tons of, you know, produce and, you know, fruit and things like that. But just during the winter, it's really hard. So yeah. do you have any, you know, good, unusual recommendations, or not even unusual, but just tasty. <laughs> yeah, so snacks, I think we forget too that snacks can be real food. You know, it doesn't have to be like cheese and crackers or something like that. So some of my favorites for like the winter time when it's cold, I love to recommend like a vegetable-based soup, like a butternut squash mm -hmm. soup, or like a minestrone or something like a cup portion. Usually ends up being calorically a normal snack. You can add a dollop of like a full fat Greek yogurt or something on that to amp up the protein content a bit can be really, really nice and super satisfying. Um, I love to do like a baked apple or a baked pear or something like that. You can throw it in the microwave or in the oven. Same thing, douse it with a bunch of cinnamon. Um, you can throw some yogurt on that or something along those lines um, or something a little bit more indulgent, sprinkle it with a little honey. That's a really nice option. Something warm and kind of sweet as well too without being like a cookie. Um, let me see some other things. Um, um, again, any kind of, um, um, what was I just going to suggest? I just lost my track. Oh, like little mini quiches could be a really nice one too. The little muffin tin quiches or muffin tin oatmeal cups, little things like that that are warm. You can heat them in the microwave. You can throw a bunch of veggies in there. You can throw a bunch of fruits on there. Or even something as simple as a small bowl of oatmeal topped with some nuts and some fresh fruit or some dried fruit or something along those lines, cacao nibs if you're looking for chocolate. Um, really warm and wholesome and kind of stick to your ribs without being really calorically burdensome. Those are great. Those are, wow. I, I don't think I've ever had any of those for snacks. So you yeah, and there's that question. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so um, I have a question. You know, I just had, we had New Year's Day brunch with some friends and mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine was, we were talking and she was saying, as I was figuring out the menu, she was saying that she was recently placed on an anti-inflammatory diet and learned that um, she was actually allergic to a bunch of foods, um, I think like nuts and some of the dry fruits that mm -hmm. she had just been eating like forever and didn't realize mm -hmm. why she, you know, she wasn't having, a really severe response, but she was just feeling not great. Um, and at first I was like, wow, that's crazy. And then I was also like, you know, our bodies don't stay the same over time, obviously, mm -hmm. and there are changes. So I guess from a nutritional standpoint, I was curious if there are, you know, any key warning signs where people should, you know, or things that might commonly happen where you could sort of be like, okay, I, I, I need to talk to somebody, I need to, yeah. you know, figure out what, what is actually going on versus just thinking, oh, I'm stressed, I'm unwell. Yeah, I think, you know, um, taking, again, like a personal health inventory is really important and kind of checking in with yourself. Um, obviously, if you're having like anaphylaxis or hives or something like that, you definitely want to go see a professional because that's a true, true allergy. Because our bodies certainly change over time. Our The bacteria in our GI tract change over time. We can develop new allergies and sensitivities. I'd say if you notice um, differences in kind of your energy levels, um, number one, chronically, and you're able to kind of take away factors of stress, um, mm -hmm. you know, or poor sleep, um, that would be a, a good warning sign that maybe something's up. Whether or not it's food related, it could just be health related. Um, I would say that if you do start noticing new changes to your um, your GI tract, our actually our 
GI system tells us a lot about our health and our what how we how our GI tract functions tells us a lot. So you know what I'm getting at. So if you do it's notice, really important. yeah, no, but it, if you do notice without changes in your typical if your typical eating patterns that you're having changes in kind of um, how how often you go or how um, you know how that looks when you go um, or cramping or bloating or anything along those lines. There's um, it, there would be a good idea to go see someone to see if there's a trigger um, or see if there's something that's, you know, in your diet now that, you know, maybe is time to to look at a little bit more. I would recommend not tr doing too many self experiments because many times we end up cutting out way too much before um, mm -hmm. we can actually figure out the cause. Okay. So I'd say, you know, it's a good idea to maybe. Um, Again, start your logging or something. If you notice some of these weird, funky things going on in the body, see if there's big proponents that you might eat really frequently. Mm -hmm. Okay to maybe do a, a short little trial, but I, I would do it really under the advice of a physician and a dietitian would be actually a great resource to help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really good. Um, do you need to get that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the phone is okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, I just, yeah, I have a, another question. So my husband recently sent me an article um, from Vox. It was 2016, but it's it's about a year and a half old. And I just thought it was really interesting because I know that in the wintertime, I get a bit sort of concerned because I'm not able to burn as many calories. Like when I'm outside in the nice weather, we're playing tennis or I'm going for a run. And in the cold weather, I just, I don't like going to the gym because I have to like get out and do that. I'd rather just do a mat workout at home, but it's just not burning the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because this article was sort of pulling together over 60 articles um, and was basically coming to the conclusion that, of course, exercise is a great thing, but ultimately what really matter is, matters is what you're eating <laughs> and, and, like, and, and just how that, that's going. So I was wondering, you know, what do you think nutritionally are the biggest pain points for people and then that if you could tweak those you'd see like a you know a big impact I guess I'm thinking like high sugar stuff or or whatever but are yeah. there certain things that you've seen in your work yeah so you know, the the obvious culprits like you said would be like the added sugars like sugar sweetened beverages or sweetened coffee drinks I know this is a good time of year for like flavored lattes and things along those lines you know anything that has what we call like an empty caloric value that just provides a lot of calories without much nutrition um, is a good place to kind of start. Um, so those would be like snack foods, a lot of packaged processed foods along those lines. I'd say though the biggest, in my experience, probably one of the biggest um, pitfalls for most people is the mindless snacking, especially mm -hmm. around nighttime, especially again, when it's this type of weather, we're home a little bit more, we're inside a little bit more, more, li more likely to munch here or there. And so really getting a grasp on your snacking and remember that snacking is meant to be um, a part of your, your eating pattern. It's not meant to be mindless. So creating a mindful approach to that, whether it's portioning things out and building it into kind of your day to day, um, but trying to get rid of the mindfulness of that. And we tend to, in that in that place, maybe gear ourselves towards foods that are a little bit less healthy, like the foods you're just talking about, the more processed foods. Um, I would say keeping some of those things that you're more triggered towards out, out of the house is a good place to start as well, too, so that you're not really tempted and really making yourself go out for those treats that might be more indulgent or might be um, the culprits that, that um, cause you to snack a little bit more. But I, I say that that's really the biggest thing in my practice. Yeah, I know, I know. What is the, um, what's the recommended sort of like end of day cutoff for snacking and eating and things? Is it usually, do people say like 8 or 9 p.m. that you should kind of stop for the evening? Yeah, or is there a hard people, line? People, there's not a really hard line because everyone's schedule is different, you know what I mean? So if you eat after 8 o'clock, it just doesn't mean you're going to gain weight. What I usually say to people is, why are you eating after dinner? You know, mm -hmm. why are you having a meal after this time? Is it because you're actually hungry or is it out of boredom? Is it stress? Are you waking up in the middle of the night? That's really where we have to draw the line. So being, a, I guess, a little bit more aware of why you're actually grabbing a snack that later time of night. If you're just someone who works late and you get home at eight and that's when you have dinner, but you're up for another three hours to digest mm -hmm. that food, and that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're coming home, eating dinner at six, and then you're you know, grabbing something from the cabinet every hour till 10 and then going to bed, that's when we have to kind of look at the, the, the more so your behavioral patterns. Right. 
Right. I have a parent hack for anybody who's listening related to this is that, um, so we get our kids ready for bed starting around eight. And um, I always, I brush my teeth and do all of my like evening stuff with them because um, if I, I brush and floss and fluoride every night, because I'm sort of obsessed with not getting cavities. And so, cause I have tons of cavities as a kid. Um, and I find that if I do that, I'm just too lazy to do it again. So um, that is, is um, Alicia has disappeared off of the screen for a moment. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, but anyway, for that's a parent hack where I use that in order to um, not have to brush again. So um, I'm not sure what happened. We just lost Alicia, but we were actually just um, close to wrapping up our broadcast. So um, I guess I will, I'm not sure what happened with our connection guys, sorry, but, um, I have a ton of great articles related to this broadcast that I'll link up stuff on healthy, natural ways to detox, exercising during the winter, all that kind of good stuff. So I will link that up in the notes for this broadcast. Um, and yeah, I hope, um, this was really helpful. If you have any comments, um, that you want to, um, put in. I'm just going to, um, pop I'm here. Can you hear me? Actually, I don't know how to pop that down. So anyway, if you have any questions that come up later, um, just feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll answer them later. And otherwise I will see you guys back here next week. Okay. Take care guys.